This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during August. This month, we'll stalk a blue moon, peek perchance at some Perseids, welcome Saturn to the evening sky, and gaze at the center of the Milky Way. So load up on the bug juice and come along on this month's sky tour. We've all spent time admiring a big, bright, full moon in the sky. And this month, you'll get to enjoy two of them. The first comes on August 1st. Native Americans knew this one as the full sturgeon moon, because during August it was easiest to catch this large fish, which was plentiful in the Great Lakes, Lake Champlain, and other major bodies of water in the Northeast. Some tribes knew it as the full red moon, due to its ruddy appearance as it rose in hazy summer skies or the green corn moon. Fast forward 29 and a half days, the length of a lunar cycle, to the night of August 30th and early on the 31st. That's when the moon will be full again for the second time this month. This quirky calendrical event has come to be called a blue moon. No, not because it looks blue, but because it doesn't happen very often. You know, like the saying, once in a blue moon, now it turns out that this term once described a very different situation. As reckoned by the Maine Farmer's Almanac during the 1930s, it would be used for the third full moon in a series of four that fall within one celestial season, in this case between June's solstice and September's equinox. So where did the two-in-one-month definition come from, the one we all know? Well, you can blame Sky and Telescope, which essentially invented it in 1946. For the full story, go to skyandtelescope.org and type what is a blue moon in the search box. Anyway, in between this month's full moon bookends will be the last quarter on August 8th, new moon on the 16th, and first quarter on the 24th. And while that big bright orb has its own beautiful charm, all that moonlight scatters across the sky and does a number on the visibility of stars. Even a first or last quarter moon is bright enough to be more hindrance than help when stargazing. So evening skies will be largely moon-free beginning about August 5th and for two weeks afterward. And as you'll hear in a moment, that timing is very fortunate. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine August without thinking about the Perseid meteor shower. This is the time when you'll see many more shooting stars than usual. The Perseids have a fairly sharp peak, which this year is forecast for the pre-dawn hours of Sunday, August 13th. You can start looking fairly soon after sunset on Saturday the 12th, as early as 9 p.m., once the constellation Perseus rises over the northeastern horizon. Then just stay up as late as you can, because as Perseus gets its highest in the sky, you might see at least one meteor per minute from a dark site free of light pollution. And keep an eye out for a couple of nights before and afterward, too. There'll be no moonlight to spoil the view, so the timing for this year's display is about as good as it gets. For a long time, no one knew what the Perseids were. Some Catholics believed that these meteors were the burning tears of St. Lawrence, who was martyred in Rome on August 10th in the year 258. Fast forward to 1837, when a Connecticut bookstore clerk named Edward Herrick saw lots of meteors on the night of August 9th. Herrick later concluded that they occur every year on the same date. And it turns out that John Locke, the headmaster of a girls' school in Cincinnati, had reached the same conclusion three years earlier. In any case, today we know that the Perseid meteors are bits of debris shed by a comet called Swift-Tuttle. Earth passes near the comet's orbit every August, and that's when tiny particles of comet dust, most the size of sand grains, slam into our atmosphere at 37 miles per second. All this happens quite high above us, about 60 miles up. Each incoming particle compresses the air in front of it, like water just ahead of a speedboat, creating a white-hot shockwave along its path. The flash of light our eyes see is that brief but brilliant shockwave, 
not the particle itself burning up. Sadly, we're no longer enjoying having a bunch of bright planets high in the evening sky after sunset every night. The situation isn't hopeless, but you will have to be outside and ready during the first week of August. Find a spot with a completely unobstructed view toward west. Wait for clear skies and watch where the sun sets. About 45 minutes after that, look along a diagonal line toward upper left from the sunset point, and you might just pick out Mercury and Mars, the two smallest major planets in the solar system. In this case, small means faint, so don't get flustered if you can't spot them, and they'll both sink lower and become unobservable by mid-month. But all is not lost, because Saturn makes its debut in the evening sky late this month. On the 26th, this ring world reaches what's called opposition, because it appears opposite the sun in the sky. As the sun sets, Saturn rises, and vice versa. Watch for it low in the east as evening twilight deepens. That not-quite-blue moon will be close by, just five degrees away, on the night of the 29th. Week by week, Saturn will climb higher in the sky at dusk. Opposition also means that Saturn is at its brightest, so you shouldn't have any trouble spotting it. And if you stay out long enough, until around midnight, you'll also be able to enjoy even brighter Jupiter rising as well, roughly in the same spot along the eastern horizon where Saturn had been earlier in the evening. Let's do a little stargazing. Turn toward south soon after nightfall, and look for a fairly bright star not far above the southern horizon. That's the star Antares. The first quarter moon is very, very close to Antares on the evening of the 24th. In fact, the moon will occult, or cover it, as seen from pretty much everywhere in the contiguous U.S. that night. From the east coast, the event occurs shortly before dawn on the 25th. But the best seats are in the central and western U.S. on the 24th you'll be able to watch the star blink out as it slips behind the dark left side of the lunar disk. If you live in the western states and have a telescope, you can even watch for the star to reappear along the moon's sunlit right-hand edge. Antares marks the heart of Scorpius, a critter whose head is marked by a vertical arc of three medium-bright stars a little to its right. In the northern hemisphere, the closer you live to the equator, the higher up you'll see the scorpion in the sky. Those of you in southern states, like Texas and Florida, have much better views than I do way up here in Massachusetts. From countries like Chile and Australia in the southern hemisphere, Scorpius appears directly overhead this time of year. Now shift your gaze to the left of Antares by about three fists. You're looking for a group of eight medium-bright stars in the shape of a teapot. The handle is on the left, and the spout, tipped down a bit, is on the right. Got it? The whole thing is about the size of your clenched fist. From northern states and Europe, the teapot is only one or two fists above the southern horizon, so it helps if you look from a spot with a clear, unobstructed view toward south. Now, when astronomers carved up the night sky, they didn't call this the teapot constellation. Instead, you found the main stars of the constellation Sagittarius, a mythological archer who is half man and half horse and you are looking toward the center of our home galaxy. If you're lucky enough to live where the sky is really dark, or if you happen to be on vacation in a rural setting, you'll see what look like puffs of steam rising from the spout. Those puffs are the countless stars of the Milky Way, which continue upward until they arch overhead and clear across the summer sky. And if you're unlucky enough to live where light pollution is rampant, which sadly is most of us, you can't see the Milky Way at all. In fact, ask yourself, have you ever seen the Milky Way in all its glory? If not, you really owe it to yourself to get out under a clear, deep black sky this time of year to see all those stars arcing across the sky like a great river of light. It's a sight you won't soon forget. Do an about face from Antares so that you're facing roughly north. After evening twilight fades, you'll see the Big Dipper hanging from its handle about halfway up in the sky. At the end of the handle are four stars forming its bowl. Your outstretched fist will just cover the bowl. Draw an imaginary line through the bottom pair of stars 
and follow it up and to the right by about three fists until you reach a medium bright star. That's the North Star, called Polaris, and in that direction you're looking due north. Now go back to the dipper and this time follow the arc of its handle to the left until, three fists away, you come to a bright star perched high above the western horizon. That's Arcturus, the fourth brightest star in the nighttime sky. As stars go, this one isn't much bigger or brighter than our own sun, but it's relatively close by, just 37 light years away. Arcturus is a Greek name meaning guardian of the bear, the constellation Ursa Major, which includes the Big Dipper. It's also the alpha star in the constellation Bootes, the plowman. Let's say that one together, Bootes. Got it? It's from the Greek words for plow and ox. The main stars of Bootes form a skinny, kite-shaped pattern, about two fists long, that stretches to the upper right from Arcturus, and that sits at the kite's bottom. Now look just to the kite's left, two fists directly above Arcturus. You're looking for a semicircle of stars, kind of shaped like a cup with no handle. This is the small, compact constellation called Corona Borealis, the northern crown. You'll need a pretty dark sky to see the entire arc, though there is a medium bright star near its midpoint. That star is named Alfeca, which is Arabic for the bright star of the broken ring. And you might wonder whether there's a southern counterpart called Corona Australis? Why, yes there is, directly below the teapot of Sagittarius. But all of its stars are pretty faint, so don't be disappointed if you can't see it. That's about it for this month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, check out Sky at a Glance at our website, skyandtelescope.org. It offers great star and planet gazing activities on a day-by-day -day basis. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this Sky Tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And please leave a rating or a review. It'll help others to find this podcast. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, please do check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and it's produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Join me next month when we'll go exploring in and around the Summer Triangle. Until then, I wish you clear skies.